Hello, and welcome to another of our We of the Wisdom or WOW series of webinars. For the next 30 minutes or so, we will be talking about split a dollar loan plans. Hello, my name is Scott Richardson, and I am founder, president, and CEO of Isaiah Financial Group. <clears throat> our mission at Isaiah Financial Group is to help you value people, improve earnings, and protect assets. We've helped our clients value people through the design and implementation of non-qualified executive and director benefit plans. We help our clients improve earnings through assets like BOLI and through sustainable multiple fee income programs. And we help you protect assets through key person and succession programs. When you think about compensation, uh, the best uh, reasonable market-based programs do a fair job of balancing three goals that really all employees have, not just your senior executives. First, we all want current income. We want to know it's benchmarked, that it's competitive to our industry, and that there's a process for keeping that uh, current, if you will, through re uh, reoccurring benchmarking. At the same time, we know that when we're done working, our savings and investments and programs and whatnot are the fuel for tomorrow's lifestyle, so we want the opportunity for wealth accumulation. No guarantees, but an opportunity. And lastly, uh, like any stool, uh, if you only have two legs, it gets kind of wobbly, so let's introduce a third one, and that's the ability to affordably manage the risks to uh, current income or wealth accumulation. Our expertise at Isaiah Financial Group focuses mainly on the wealth accumulation, and that's what we'll be uh, talking about today. Before you get into talking about a specific executive benefit plan, however, uh, we think your first step ought to be to determine if you have disparity or some shortfall to a targeted amount. <clears throat> this helps you answer the who, which executives are impacted, why, uh, understand that there's no covert or even overt action that is going on in most organizations. There's some embedded limitations and other existing programs in the tax code, but understand the why. And lastly, able to help identify and peg a dollar amount, the what amount uh, of a benefit you may need to replace. The amount of any executive benefit that you offer needs to be reasonable. It needs to be defensible, and you need to have a clear process to document and, and justify this. When we talk about disparity, what we're talking about is the impact of limitations that we see that are in uh, the social security programs that apply to qualified plans like a 401k or profit sharing. And so what you'll see here, very simple summary that you have a, an employee, rank and file employee who might be making 44 or 45,000 a year. Um, if you have a typical formula as what we see as a starting point anyway, that employee is gonna get 35 to 40% minimum of their income replaced in programs in retirement by programs paid for by your employer. As you go up the compensation ladder and the rank in the organization, you get over to an executive that might be making, say, 175000 a year. Well, the same programs, because remember, all employees <coughs> excuse me, have to participate on the same terms. So the same programs result in a replacement ratio that's considerably less. So we often see a raw difference of anywhere from 10 to 25%. Uh, but the general rule is as income goes up, the replacement percentages go down. Most employers don't understand this approach very much, and once they do, they're usually motivated to, at a minimum, try to make executives retire at the same basis as rank and file. Once you've identified the who, the what, and the why, now we really get into the how. Uh, these are different tools that you can pull off a shelf and deploy to help fill out that total compensation package. As you uh, look at the next couple of screens, understand that these are not mutually exclusive options. We, uh, you can, uh, and we have clients who do have more than one option, not only for a single executive, but certainly within their executive ranks. You need to figure out what works best for what you're trying to accomplish, not uh, what some vendor is trying to sell you. So this is a grid that kind of gives you a, a high level overview of the four different options that we typically see. Uh, in the tax exempt world, we've got a 457F plan, we've got a 457B plan, there's a split dollar loan, and then what we call a section 162 SERP. Uh, today, we'll 
we're talking about split dollar loans only. <clears throat> so what is a split dollar loan? So its basic description is the employer lends money to the executive to pay the premiums on an insurance contract, a life insurance contract that is then owned by the executive. When I say lend, um, it's unlike your traditional loan context, so keep, uh, keep that separate from what you might do as an everyday occurrence in a credit union, for example, but this is lending to meet the requirements of the IRS for compensation purposes. That loan has to accrue interest and it has to actually be repaid back to the employer. If not, then there's some income tax consequences to the executive that kind of uh, make the, the money up the modeling, if you will. Uh, the most common interest rate that we see used is what's called the AFR or applicable federal rate. And that rate is, um, it's the rate that is in existence in the month that a loan uh, in the form of premiums is advanced to the executive. So if you have a single event, that's just once. If you have 10, you have 10. The reason it works is the insurance policy values are expected to yield more than the AFR. It's very simple. Uh, so we're looking for arbitrage. Split dollar loan has been around since, so oh my gosh, the late 50s or early 60s. And it has ebbed and flowed in terms of how attractive it is based upon that arbitrage. There are points in time where uh, there hasn't been much daylight at all between what the IRS wants to accrue and what the policy can earn. And there are times like now when there is daylight and the region, uh, there can be some very attractive designs. At some point at, uh, certainly no later than death, but some point before if we have enough time to design properly, all of those premium loans plus all of the accrued interest is then repaid from the policy itself. Um, so the, uh, there's a collateral assignment on the policy in favor of the employer. And it tells the insurance company that the first dollar of death benefits first go to satisfy what that obligation is and only when there's something left over does it go to the beneficiaries of the executive. Same thing with the surrender value. Uh, when it's appropriate and we have a predefined period on these things, the executive now has the ability to take tax-free, income tax-free distributions using a combination of loans and withdrawals to supplement their retirement income. Here's what I'm talking about in terms of the arbitrage. This is a little dated, but it's from last year, but conceptually you'll see the same thing. Uh, the IRS rate at that point was 2%. Uh, Today, in April of 2019, it's actually uh, just over 3%, but it was 2% uh, last year. We were able to lock in that rate on an indefinite basis, and here was the underlying return of the policy. So four or five years, we'll talk about this uh, later. Uh, it's a little underwater as it uh, ramps up, but then this gain in later years is what creates the positive arbitrage that then allows us to create the tax-free distributions to the executive. <clears throat> Conceptually, if you want to think about it, there's sometimes there's a single policy. Sometimes we see two policies. Uh, we can always squeeze out uh, at certain ages and whatnot uh, some efficiencies by using two policies. But those policies provide both the benefits to the executive and the recovery um, protection for the employer. So the employer, as they have this, again, they have annual earnings. Uh, there is a crude interest income, so there's an earnings element to this unlike other executive benefits. And again, recovery of principal. And here on the executive side, uh, when designed properly, we have no income taxes. We have tax-free retirement income. There's an income tax-free death benefit. And at certain ages and certain designs, we can even take advantage of uh, long-term care or chronic illness riders that may be available on the underlying life insurance policy. <clears throat> So as we begin the design process, the first question that you have to ask is what kind of loan do you want? There are only two. It's either a demand loan or a term loan, and which type you choose determines which interest rate the IRS publishes that you can use. So a demand loan is just like it sounds. The employer at any and all points in time has the ability to demand repayment. So it's not very attractive for some executives uh, because if that loan extends into retirement, uh, for example, and it's age 75 or age 80, you don't know who the board is at that point. You don't know what circumstances may exist. 
and there's not a lot of comfort and confidence that that loan won't be called. Um, the trade-off to having the demand feature is you may potentially have a lower interest rate. So this uses what's called a blended rate from the IRS. It's updated once a year, every July 1st, and as long as the loan is outstanding, you readjust that rate. Uh, last July, it was increased to 1.09%. Absolutely expected to increase again this July. Um, but there's some greater arbitrage in some years with the demand feature. Because of the demand feature, however, most executives are uncomfortable with that. And the default then, if it's not demand, it's term. Uh, with a term loan, the rate that you use is locked in for that payment on the date that you have any advance or loan by the employer. So back in November, it was 2.6. Here in April, it's 3.04. Um, that rate has been as low as 1.65, and it's trending upwards. But again, if you can uh, have a single funding event, which we'll talk about in a second, you may be able to lock in that rate indefinitely. Very attractive from a design feature. Um, and this is where I'm talking about the prepayment. Um, some carriers have the ability to uh, accept prepaid premiums. So if you have the underlying policy might have seven or 10 premium payments, but we can prepay them to the insurance carrier. In the eyes of the IRS from this arrangement, that's considered a single loan event. And that allows us to lock in that rate. You accelerate your funding requirement, but the upside is, is it eliminates the modeling uncertainty that comes with not knowing what the IRS interest rate, the AFR, is going to be in future years. We all we assume it's going up, we have to model it's going up, but we don't really know how high or how far that's going to go. So it leaves to, um, some uncertainty and we can eliminate that. Second question is, um, it, there may be some taxes in this arrangement. Um, so for example, if you aren't accruing and being repaid at the employer side at the interest rate the IRS requires. That's what's called a below market loan, and that has some tax consequences. At the same time, this prepaid account that I talked about a moment ago, um, most carriers, all carriers with a premium deposit account will give you a discount. Well, that discount um, is actually taxable income to the executive. So the question is, is to the extent that there are income taxes, how will that be handled? Um, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, we see uh, what's called a tax fund account being set up. So in addition to a fund to pay premiums, we have a separate fund uh, from which the executive can withdraw to pay income taxes that are estimated. All of it is recovered by the employer with interest using the same uh, loan regime uh, regulations in the tax code. You can also do what's called a double bonus or a single bonus. Um, so you help the executive with some additional cash compensation along the way, or um, you can just let the executive to their own devices. Again, these are in decreasing order in how frequently that we see them. I would say the tax fund account is probably used 90 plus percent of the time to give you an idea of how infrequent the other options are. Next question you need to ask or address is uh, recourse. And this is, um, there's a loan here. The collateral for the loan is the cash surrender value of the policy. And in some years, that cash surrender value may be less than the loan plus the accrued interest. So the question is, will the credit union require the executive to personally guarantee that shortfall to make them repay? Remember, this isn't a death scenario. On a death scenario, we always have enough death benefit to repay the credit union and provide for the family. This is a balance sheet issue from gap perspective. If you surrender the arrangement and there's a shortfall, who's responsible? Um, obviously, this affects what you can accrue and reflect on your balance sheet. So if there is no personal guarantee by the executive, then any shortfall must be adjusted through the income statement. Um, and if there is a personal guarantee with, or recourse in this concept, make sure you follow through and document the executive's ability to actually repay it. Because in order to reflect the full balance sheet value, you, you have to have a, um, a demonstrated ability to repay it. Next question is, well, exactly when is the executive entitled to take distributions from the policy? Uh, clearly, if we've defined retirement as age 65, that's um, and they retire at 65, and that's a clear uh, starting point. 
But is there some point before them that they can have some right, gradual vesting right? There's no single answer to this question. There are multiple ones, and you have to take each case as it comes. So we've had clients who had executives for 25 years who are now putting in an arrangement when the executive is you know, 55, 56. That lends towards a, an accelerated vesting. Maybe there's some vesting in year one, day one. Uh, at the same time, we've had folks who are um, just promoted to their executive and or maybe only one or two years into it, and they're in their mid-40s. Um, the goal with these things is to retain and reward folks. So if you give them too much vesting too soon, you eliminate or, or greatly uh, water down the retention element. And so the design there might be, hey, there's no vesting for three or four or five years. Uh, and then you gradually build into it. So vesting, again, is an art and science here, um, as you saw on the, on the title slide. I want to underscore here that uh, you cannot have vesting with a demand loan. If you think about what I define as a demand loan, the employer at all times has to have the ability to demand repayment. If you subsequently try to give the executive any vesting, that demand feature no longer exists. You have to to give the executive something. Um, and so if you have a demand loan that has vesting, it really is a term loan. Um, the counter argument, well, it's no longer a split dollar, you're gonna offer some other type of benefit. Well, in the tax exempt world, that can only be something like a 457, and now you've got immediate vesting with immediate taxation, uh, very complicated. So no vesting on demand loans. Um, and again, full vesting, partial vesting, forfeiture for certain events, uh, these are the events that we talk about. Uh, clearly, meaning, uh, remaining employed to a specified age or date like age 65. Um, early voluntary termination. This is the executive saying, I'm out for whatever reason. Uh, there ought to be some um, early year forfeiture, um, if it's age 63 or 64, when the normal is 65. There may be full vesting by that point, but understand how that plays. Um, termination for disability. We see a lot of accelerated vesting here. The expectation is the executive would have retained or stayed until 65, but for the disability. Termination by the employer without cause. Uh, we see some accelerated vesting frequently here because this is sort of a level playing field. Uh, the executive didn't do anything wrong. They just decided that they are not the organization's leader anymore. Uh, and then, of course, termination for cause is the last one. Uh, termination for cause is uh, a complete forfeiture. If the executive does bad things, such that cause is warranted, then they don't get anything out of this. And usually there might even be some personal obligation. Uh, if it wasn't there before, it is there on termination for cause. Um, oh, last one, sorry, merger with or without termination. So what happens after a change of control or a merger? <clears throat> Continuing in the design, uh, the next thing we talk about is the timing of distributions. Again, is it a fixed start date at age 65, or is it flexible termination after 65? Um, a little bit challenging here because we're working with an underlying life insurance policy that while it has some flexibility, there's a limit to that flexibility when we're trying to design and model these things. So understand how that works. Uh, how long? Uh, is it for five years, for 10 years, or is it... Uh, for just as long as the policy can support a certain level of income. Most of the time, to provide certainty of funding and modeling, we do for a set number of years, you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Next question becomes this, uh, this concept of what we call a borrowing cap, and it really comes down to um, the underlying life insurance policy, I promise you, will not perform exactly the way that it's modeled on day one. No one is that good. No carrier, no vendor. And so to the extent the underlying uh, actual performance of the policy differs from the initial modeling, will the credit union come back and add more money to it as if it, if it underperforms, or will the executive take a smaller benefit? Um, I can tell you that most arrangements, um, the, gear, the credit union is just making an upfront commitment to a certain funding stream and so therefore the performance of the policy, the risk of that is on the shoulders of the executive. That screams for conservative modeling, so that you increase the chances of achieving. Um, and of course, if you exceed your conservative modeling, that would provide a greater benefit to the executive. 
but that's a fair trade off for taking that risk. We know that if uh, the executive dies, there far more death benefit than we need to repay the employer, allowing us to provide something for their family. But do we have enough time? Do you have a young enough executive to plan for a repayment before death? Um, there's no bright line here. Underwriting uh, considerations sort of come into play as well. But if you have an executive who's, I'd say, under the age of 50, I would absolutely look at modeling what it would take to get repaid by 65 or 70, for example. Get in and out in 15 or 20 years. Um, executives that are over the age of 60, darn near impossible to do. Um, that muddy middle, the gray 50 to 60 year old could be possible, but um, less likely. Um, the nice thing about planning for repayment, yes, it increases your funding obligation up front, but now you have a date certain where you're going to be out. And it happens to coincide, if you do it around 65 or 70, about the time you might want to do a similar arrangement for your next successor CEO, for example. So it's good timing. Up until this point, we haven't even talked about the underlying insurance policy. Uh, and now that we know how we're designing it, we can start to look at this. Um, so we have a couple of different options here. There's a whole life policy, which offers very strong guarantees not a whole lot of volatility from year to year in terms of the dividend rates. Um, they are adjusted once a year, but it's a slow moving ship. Um, and so as interest rates have come down, those rates have been reset down. As interest rates go up, it will move much more slowly. Nothing wrong with whole life. It's just a different slower. Um, we see quite frequently indexed universal life where there's an underlying insurance policy whose crediting rate only, never the cash values, the crediting rate only is based upon some change in an external index, most often the S&P 500, for example. Um, so your cash surrender values, again, won't move up and down by a penny based upon what the market does. But with the S&P, um, the index approach, we look at the end of the year and measure the change in the index. If it was zero or below, sometimes 1% is a floor, that becomes your crediting rate, 0% or 1%. Um, so if you have a negative 20% in the S&P, cash surrender values aren't changed, you just don't have any earnings. On the other side of that, we measure the positive return, and if it's 5, 6, 7%, that's your crediting rate. If it's 20%, like it has been recently on the S&P, then uh, you're going to hit a cap. In other words, uh, the carrier puts a limit, 9, 10, 11% on that. So what you're buying is a kind of a corridor of 0 to 10%, roughly, uh, and what we have is the greater potential to outperform. Uh, so most often when we illustrate these things, we're illustrating at 6% uh, or less on the S&P on an average basis. Um, so the expectation is that when we outperform in some years, most years, then uh, the executive will get a higher benefit. But again, neither one of those, by the way, is right or wrong. Uh, age of the executive does come into the play, um, risk tolerances and those things. Underwriting considerations are another big factor in determining the insurance carrier. Uh, so if you put this into the lending context, it is not all uh, lending or financial institutions will look at the same credit risk in the same way. You have different appetites for different types of loans, different types of credit risks. Insurance companies, the same thing. Um, so if you're squeaky clean and healthy and all those things, then that's less of an issue. But as you age and we have cholesterol, we've got family history issues that come into play. Some carriers just are better at these risks than others. And lastly, um, again, we're not designing this for death benefit. We want to build it up and take it out to provide a tax-free income for the executive. So the efficiency of getting money out of the policy is a big consideration. And I would tell you that not all carriers make it easy to get money out. They're very good, a strong track record of growing cash surrender values, but not on the distribution side. And you need to be mindful of that. So I'm going to give you a quick snapshot of an example here. Uh, this was a case we did recently. Uh, this was a, a younger executive, so he's 49 years old this year. And um, we're modeling this, as you can see here, assuming a standard non-smoker rate. Uh, we think the executive will be um, will be uh, much better than that, but uh, we model it conservatively. We're trying to target 54,000 a year of tax-free income for the executive beginning at age 62 for a period of 20 years. 
And when you back into all of that, these assumptions, it says that, hey, based upon a 3.04% uh, IRS rate, which is what we're going to accrue at, we need a loan of $1,651,000 and some change. It's about 2.5% of the net worth of the, uh, of the credit union, which isn't that comp you know, large, relatively speaking. <clears throat> um, and we'll show you how that's applied. We're going to take that million six fifty one, and here's what happens to it: a million five ninety six eight fourteen goes right to the insurance company. They're going to take out one hundred and seventy eight thousand dollars right away to pay the premium, deposit the rest into a premium deposit account balance, and at the end of year one, they're going to take the second year's premium, the third year's, and so on through the end of that ten year period. Well, these these are discounts. This is a million five ninety six is less than a million seven eighty, which is the sum of these premiums, and it's less by the amount of one hundred and eighty three thousand one eighty five. So this is, goes back to that tax consequence. That one eighty three we know with certainty is going to be taxed or reported as taxable income for the executive on ten ninety nines, ten thousand six forty one in the first ten ninety nine declining until they get the last one. Excuse me, that thirty five four seventy. Well, if the executive's in a 30% bracket at that point, effective, we're not, we're not talking marginal, we're talking effective, then um, what, uh, it's going to be about $55,000 of tax out of pocket. So the balance of this loan, 54955 goes into a deposit account, uh, we call it a tax fund account, and it goes right into a savings account right there at the credit union. Zero interest, zero dividend, and once a year, roughly equal to what we expect the taxes. The executive has a scheduled right to take a withdrawal. But the key to remember here is this million six fifty one is the total of the sums and this has to be repaid all at once with interest. <clears throat> From the employer's perspective, here's how this looks. Um, I said we're accruing it at 3.04. So the first year there's fifty thousand of accrued interest. Second year it compounds fifty one seven and so on. By the end of the tenth year we now have a, an accrued receivable of 2228 20 years, 3006 and again, this executive was young enough, we're getting out. So we're repaying it on day one of year 21, end of year 20. On the death benefit scenario, we know we have enough death benefit at all times. This is just the employer's share of the death benefit so that it equals in every year what the cumulative loan plus accrued interest is. At the same time, we're measuring the liquid collateral. What's the surrender value of the policy? Not the death value, the surrender value, plus unpaid premiums in the premium deposit account, plus the unpaid withdrawals in the tax fund account. Um, obviously, after 10 years, the surrender value is the policy, but in the early years, you can see we have a shortfall. We have a collateral shortfall. That If you had to unwind this arrangement, for example, at the end of year five, the receivable is a million nine eighteen five seventy five. The collateral is estimated at a million six eighty nine four zero four for a shortfall of two twenty nine. So this gets back to that question: is is this a personal obligation of the executive? Well, in this model, we're showing it's not a personal obligation. So that's why we see this change in collateral recourse as an adjustment that the employer has to recognize through the income statement. In other words, they're growing interest at 50,000, then they're adjusting capital by, or the, uh, the collateral by uh, 67. So at the end of the year, the net impact is $17,000. That's what it costs the credit union. Now in year two, we're accruing 51,000. Our change in the collateral falls as that cash render value begins to grow by 49,000, the net the two out, and it's positive now in the second year, just for that second year. And you can so on and on and accumulatively, there is no other other executive benefit where without doing some additional funding, uh, like a Boley strategy, for example, that this can be P&L positive into itself. From a regulatory perspective, you should understand that the NCUA released some field examination guidance. They've allowed split dollar loan for a long time, uh, but they're trying to rein in what they found is to be some uh, egregious designs. So this guidance was released last fall that applies to obviously the federal credit unions as well as to FISCUs. One thing that they're really underscoring is make sure that accounting is correctly applied. And this gets back to that shortfall in the collateral 
in the absence or presence of a personal obligation by the executive. You have to make sure that that's done. At the same time, they've also been very clear now that there is a limit, a single carrier limit in terms of uh, how much exposure the organization can have, not per executive, but the organization, and it's 15% of net worth. And if it exceeds 15%, they've given you three years to get it back under, to growing capital, somehow reducing your exposure, moving a policy around if you need to, um, or unless you can have very special circumstances that are compelling, they will give you action. Could be a prompt corrective action, could be a camel ding um, rating or so. Other thing that they said in this guidance is, um, this is a deviation from what they did in prior practice is, all assets that you now purchase uh, to offset benefits, whether it's a split dollar loan plan, a BOLI asset, a managed account, you know, variable annuity, all these things that come into this broad-based um, offsetting benefits uh, now have a single uh, soft limit of 25%. Um, so if you go over 25% in the aggregate, they tell you to expect what's called an expanded scope of examination, and they lay out the requirements that they're going to, you know, what, what that means in the expanded scope. Not difficult to comply with, but just be prepared for those if you end up going over 25%. Uh, uh, some states, this is the NCUA, but we, we have uh, had some conversations with some states who take a harsher view of split dollar. Um, but here's the thing. Whether you're a state or a federal credit union, uh, document your analysis going back to why you need to offer an executive benefit in the first place. Make it very clear. Um, document that you looked at alternatives and that split dollar our loan and your situation was uh, met what you're trying to achieve. Limit what you do with any single executive, limit what you do with all executives in terms of uh, a single carrier and even relative to your overall net worth. Um, and some final thoughts. The split dollar loan is easy to get into and can be tough to exit because uh, remember in those first five to seven years, the collateral, the surrender value of the policy is underwater. Uh, the loan is accruing faster than the policy is earning initially. Um, and so just be mindful of the impact if you have to unwind it in the first you know, five to seven years. Um, I would argue that it's less about the carrier and more about the process. There are only a handful of carriers that are uh, actively and, and, and wanting this kind of uh, business, the split dollar loan arrangements in a tax exempt organization. They're all strong. Um, but the process will help um, identify and really set down your modeling that makes that carrier selection, frankly, much easier. And lastly, servicing. This comes down to being very clear and having a well-documented arrangement. Uh, when it's done properly, they're not that difficult to service. It's just a long service period. Uh, and it could be done directly with the insurance company uh, if you lost your vendor, for example. Um, however, it does take some effort. Uh, and the effort that a vendor expends, you know, every year should be compensated through either service fees or through trailing compensation. So just ask if the policy that you're looking at has trails that can be transferable to a future vendor just in case you fall out of favor with your current one. So we thank you for uh, listening in to us today. Hope you learned a little bit and encourage you to reach out as we learn, uh, help you with your split dollar or other executive benefit arrangements. Thank you.